Welcome to our evening devotional on this Monday evening Memorial Day. And I hope you're doing well. We'll give a few moments for folks to get joined in and uh, get plugged in. It's like Sister Janice and Brother Randy is joining us. Good to have y'all already, Sister Betty Miller. Hello, hello, hello. Sister DJ, Sister Peggy, good to see y'all. My camera's kind of acting funny. Let me readjust some here. Sister Tara is with us. Hello, hello. Excuse me just a minute. I gotta make. I'm sorry, I'm having to plug in the cable, so I'm having to readjust the angle here. Sister Jody is watching. Sister Jody's joined us. Hello, hello. Sister Tina heard. And Sister Rhonda Briars. Do -do -do -do. Hope y'all are doing well this Memorial Day and being thankful for the lives that have been given for our freedom, uh, though a lot of people aren't appreciating it these days, but um, there's been a lot of sacrifices for our wonderful country. Hey, Kim, Sister Kim Miller, some of the Miller clan is with us. Momento, por favor. Oh, we'll give just a few minutes and then we'll get started here. Again, I hope you're all doing doing very well. I'm doing two or three things at once here, forgive me, until we get started here. Well, let's get started. Let's go ahead and get started this evening. I know that it is Memorial Day. Y'all may be grilling out for supper or doing something, and so uh, we will get right to the point and get this devotion underway. I want to read from the book of Isaiah, chapter number 26 tonight. Isaiah, chapter number 26. So I'll give you a minute to turn there. Isaiah 26. Hey, Brother Steve and uh, Sister Melanie. Sister Pritchard have joined us. Good to have y'all. Good to have y'all in there. Isaiah chapter number 26, and I want to look at verse number 3, if you will. 
verse number three of Isaiah 26. And um, Isaiah 26 and three reads like this. It says, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. And it goes on to say in verse four, trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And then I want you, hey, Sister Lori, uh, look at verse number 12 of Isaiah 26 as well. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us. For thou also hast wrought all our works in us. So if we could kind of read verse 3 and verse 12 together, uh, just to kind of give us an idea of what we're looking at. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou also hast wrought all our works in us. And simply this evening, I, I want to talk to you just a simple, simple uh, devotion tonight about uh, just as you've probably seen in the, uh, in the description, I'm just calling this perfect peace. Um, and I, I just want to elaborate on that subject. It says here in verse three, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Because the mind that is stayed on the Lord trusts in the Lord. Now, verse 12 says, you will ordain peace for us. For thou hast also wrought all our works in us. In other words, it is a uh, predetermined thing by God. God has anointed the peace for us that we so desperately need. Uh, if there's ever been any time, certainly, that we need peace, we need peace. But as Jesus said in John 14, he said, I'm going to leave you with peace. He says, I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to leave my peace with you. But he says, not as the world gives do I give, but he said, my peace I leave with you. And we could go into talking about the peace of God, peace with God, all that. I'm not, not doing that tonight. Um, but I do want to talk about what it means to have perfect peace. Now, Going back to Psalm 119, there is a verse, and if you're writing notes, just write this down. You don't necessarily have to turn there, but in Psalm 119 and 165, it says this, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So let me, let me read these three together. In Psalm 119, 165, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Then going to Isaiah, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou also hast wrought all our works in us. Now, what does he mean by perfect peace? Now, the psalmist makes the statement, he says, great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Let's deal with that first. He said, great peace. And what that literally means is, hey, Sister Jan Hammy, uh, what that literally means is abounding peace, great peace, abounding, overflowing, more than we need, peace. Have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Can I just say before we go any further that the peace that God intends for you and I to have is an overflowing peace. Uh, it is a peace that, as the scripture says, and I'm going to reference that in a few moments, peace that, come on, I know you're thinking it, peace that passes all understanding. Well, that is the peace that David is talking about in Psalm 119. So he says, great peace have they which love thy law, nothing shall offend them. Abounding, overflowing peace have they which love thy law, nothing shall offend them. And the word offend is not the word offend that we normally think of as somebody getting their feelings hurt. The word offend there means an occasion of stumbling or a stumbling block. So it would read like this, abounding, overflowing peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall trip them up. Think about this. If you have... 
the abounding peace of God, then that peace of God, that presence, that security, that safety in God will keep you from stumbling. It will keep you from getting distracted. It will keep you from compromising in your faith and your direction. It will keep you from being defeated. Um, Sister Janice says it's freezing up. Let me see here. Uh, we've got good signal. Um, is everybody else good? Brother Leon's watching. Um, is it still freezing up? Um, Brother Joey has joined us. Is it freezing up on my end? Is everybody else good? Or is it maybe an internet deal on your end, Sister Janice? I don't know if, if we're good, we're not freezing up. Y'all throw me some thumbs up in there so I know to keep going or if we need to reboot or whatever. Uh, Brother Joey says, no, good here. Sue is next door, so she says, good, all good. Okay, Sister Janice, it may have been mine glitching for a minute, but it may have been... Um, I don't know, it may have been something there uh, on your internet. So let me continue real quick. So in Isaiah where he says, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Perfect peace. Now, it says also back in Psalm 119, 165, it says this, great peace. Abounding, overflowing peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall cause them to stumble. Nothing shall cause them to be tripped up because they have great peace. They have great security in the Lord. And now when you come back to Isaiah chapter number 26, he says, perfect peace. We go from great peace, which is abounding, to perfect peace. Peace. Now, what does that mean? Now, what is interesting, if you do a word study, you will find that the word peace there uh, means shalom. It is the Jewish word for peace, of course, shalom. But what's funny about this is, is that the word perfect also means shalom. So what he says in Isaiah 26 is, thou wilt keep him in peace, peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Anytime that God in his word doubles or especially triples, there's only one thing in the Bible that, is, that, that God uses in triplicate, and that is his holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But when he does stuff in duplicate, it is like putting an exclamation point. It is like highlighting. You'll remember that when Jesus is teaching, he says a lot of times, verily, verily, I say unto thee. That is a statement that Jesus is saying, hey, listen up, listen up. This is what I'm saying. This is important. This is important. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you. So whenever you get here in Isaiah 26, he says, thou will keep him in peace, peace. That is the epitome of abounding peace. God doesn't want you just to have his peace. He wants you to have peace, peace peace. He wants you to have a double portion, if you will. He wants you to have more than great. Great is abounding, but peace, peace is complete. Perfect peace. He was saying an absolute perfection in peace. I want to tell you, God doesn't want you just to get through. God doesn't want you just to survive. God doesn't want you just to make it over the hump through these times we're facing. God wants you to thrive. God wants his people to abound. He wants you to abound. I'm not talking a prosperity gospel. He doesn't care about your finances, doesn't care about your money. It has nothing to do with material possessions. But what he does want out of us as believers to demonstrate an over overabundance of peace and the presence of God. Why? So that a world that is hurting, dying, lost, and is broken will look at somebody like you and I and will say, what do you have that I need? It was the intention of God when Joshua and the children of Israel crossed over Jordan and they put up those stones and, and, and God said, you put those stones here because in time to come, generations that follow your children's children will ask a question. Why are these stones here? What mean ye by these stones? And somebody will say, well, this is what God did. The tragedy of our hour is that we, for the most part as the church, we live in this world that is broken and in need of Christ more than 
ever before, and yet we never live to such a degree that it causes anybody to ask a question. They never ask, why don't you do what I do? Why don't you live the way I live? No, what they see is people that have learned to blend in like chameleons. We, we have learned just to kind of blend in, not make a ruckus, not stand out, not cause trouble. If you'll remember when the prophet Elijah, when he comes to Ahab and he pronounces a famine and he, uh, for three and a half years, there's a drought and I mean, he's just really turning their little happy world upside down. And the, one of the times that Ahab sees Elijah, he says, he says, well, there's Elijah, the man that troubleth Israel. And he said, no, sir, you're the one that troubles Israel. You see, uh, do we live a life that even stands out? Do we live a life that people say, you must have something I do not have? What is it? God wants us especially more than ever in this hour, not just to walk around with a little bit of peace, not just to say, well, I'm okay, I'm making it, but to have a perfect peace, to have an abounding peace, a peace, peace, as Isaiah 26 and 3 says. Now, having said that, we go from David in Psalm 119. He says, great peace. Isaiah says in Isaiah 26 and 3, he says, peace, peace, or perfect peace. Now, now, now I want to go to the New Testament reference because it, it is necessary for us to go uh, over to the book of Philippians. And if you've got your Bible handy, turn over there, if you will, uh, to the book of Philippians. And I, I want to show you something very quickly in the book of Philippians. And in Philippians chapter number four, it's a very familiar passage to many of you. It says in, in, in Philippians four and verse six, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But that's not the end of it. Many times we will only quote that and we'll say, oh, the peace of God that passes all understanding. Oh, we need the peace of God that passes all understanding. But do you understand the fact that that peace has already been given by God? It is up to us whether we receive it and walk and operate in it. So what do you mean by that? In verse 8. Finally, my brother, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, just, pure, lovely, a good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now watch, verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace, not the peace of God now, but the God of peace shall be with you. Now, so what is the truth of all of this? Notice. The perfect peace that we need from God in Isaiah 26 and 3, notice what it says. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace or shalom, shalom, peace, peace. But here's the contingency. Whose mind is stayed on thee. For the peace, the double peace, the shalom, shalom, the peace, peace, perfect peace, if you will, for it to be resident in my life and yours, it all rides on where my mind resides. It all depends on what my mind is dependent upon. Let me say that again. It all depends on what my mind is dependent upon. So notice what it says. Notice it says perfect peace, peace, peace. Shalom, shalom. Isaiah 26 and 3. You will give him peace, peace, perfect peace, watch, whose mind is stayed on thee. So we've gone from Psalm 119, 165, great peace have they that love thy law. Nothing shall stumble or cause a stumbling block in them. Nothing shall offend them. To Isaiah 26 and 3, great peace. He says, then we go to perfect peace. Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Now we come to Philippians 4, and here's what it really begins to, where it begins to take shape. The P, verse 7, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, all of our physical understanding faculties, 
shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So watch this. In Philippians 4, we have a double portion peace. We have a peace, peace. Like Isaiah 26 and 3 says, Thou shalt, thou wilt keep him in peace, peace, perfect peace, shalom, shalom, whose mind is stayed on thee. In Philippians 4, we have a double portion peace. We have in verse 7, the peace of God, which passeth our human understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But the second portion of that peace takes place in verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. You see, on one hand, we've got peace, but now we've got the possibility of enjoying peace, peace. The peace that passeth all understanding and the God of peace. Now, the first level of this peace is done by gift of God. The peace of God that passeth all understanding keeps your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It is a gift of God. It is a blessing of God. By being in Christ, I am under the peace speaker, the, the prince of peace, if you will. But then he adds a contingency. Remember Isaiah 26 and 3? Thou wilt give him, or keep him rather, in Perfect peace, here's the contingency, whose mind is stayed on thee. So it's what I do with the salvation peace that determines the perfect peace. Okay, what is it, Pastor? Here he says it. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things, and then he goes down the list. True, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, if there be any praise, Think on these things. Those things which you have both learned, received, and heard, and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. What is the difference? Moving from the initial peace of salvation to the peace, peace of abundant living and serving the Lord is going to take place when I decide in full surrender that I'm going to consume myself with the thoughts of God. It is all about the mind of the Lord. It is not about programming your mind. You see, we get a lot of hyper faith, silly, stupid, spiritual people that uh, want to say, well, you got to think positive thoughts. You know, you get the, uh, you, you know, excuse me, I know I'm going to make some people mad, but that's all right, that's where I live. You get the Joel Osteen sermons, it's all about good, no sin, no nothing, no nothing, and more positive confession. That's Eastern mysticism, folks, not the gospel. But... We are commanded to think on certain things, not positively confess something. And yes, we do profess and we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus, but not just changing things by thinking positive. That is not how this, the gospel works. The gospel is a work of faith, not a work of desire or emotion. So, when I come to Philippians 4, he says, look, the peace of God that passes understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Then he says... The next phase is up to you. What you think on, what you dwell on and, and think on, and what it really means here in, in Isaiah 26 and 3, the mind means the thoughts, the imaginations, and the purposes of life. So whatever I set my heart to, what I imagine my imaginations dwell on, what my thought life is consumed with, is what my life will be absorbed with. Even though I can be saved, I can be absorbed thinking about something else and miss the full blessing of God. So he says, you've got to think on things that are true, things that are honest, just, pure, lovely, good report. Think on the virtues, think on the praise. Then he says... If you think on these things, he says the God of peace will be with you. That is peace, peace. Let me tell you something. Sometimes we think our thought life is not as important because guess what? You know, we've heard that, you know, to think on something is not sin. To dwell on it, act on it, it becomes sin. Uh, you know, as long as it, if it's a, yes, the devil can throw a fiery dart and give you a thought in your mind. But if you allow that thought, even if you don't physically act on it, you, as Jesus said, you can lust and you can hate and still be guilty of that crime. You never have to follow through. The thought may come, but when I dwell on it and allow it to change and allow it to direct me, it becomes a sin. 
Watch this though. We think that maybe the thought life is not that important, but do you realize that in these verses that we treat so carelessly sometimes, we think, oh, the peace of God passes understanding. Oh, think on these lovely, pure, and honest things. Think on those things, you know. And, and, and we, we talk about these verses of Philippians 4, but have we ever really stopped to consider the fact that, that your thought life and my thought life is so important to God that he literally instructs us here what we're supposed to be thinking about. You say, well, why does God care about what I think? But as long as I'm not acting it out, what does it matter? Oh, it matters because remember, the seed of behavior is always in the mind. Everything is conjured in the mind before it takes shape. That device or computer that you're watching this devotion on and listening to it, before it became a tangible uh, uh, Device before it became a tangible piece of equipment, it was it was somebody's thought, it was somebody's mind. Whether it's these lights or uh, you know any anything physical, tangible that's been invented or built or created was first a thought. Well, folks, this whole universe, including us, we were first a thought in the mind of God. Paul says at one point, he said, look, he says, it, it, our minds don't understand it. No eye has seen, no heart can understand it. He said, uh, all the things that God's prepared for the Lord. He says, but, but they are understood by the Spirit. And he goes on to say, we have the mind of Christ. It is the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the mind of Christ. Make no mistake about it. The Holy Spirit is the mind of Christ. He put that mind in his body, the church, the believers. We are the physical body that are just simply here to act out what that mind tells the body to do. That's, that's a Christian in a nutshell. It is Christ living in his body, the church, by way of his mind, the Holy Spirit. So the mind and your thoughts are so important that God took time to instruct us what even to think about. You know, I fa I, 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 it's really interesting. I, I began dwelling on something the other day. Um, you know, if you, uh, I, I was watching, uh, there was some skydive video or something and different things. And I began to just think about, you know, um, over the years, we've always, you know, you know, we've ridden rides and we were youth pastors, of course, for years. And I uh, love roller coasters, and you can sit and think about the most terrifying ride you've ever been on, if you're one of those people. Uh, and, and you can simply just think about it hard enough, and your emotions start changing. If you ever think about something that makes you nervous, you're, you're, you, I mean, your heart will skip a beat if it's something really, really powerful or impactful in your life, or uh, if you think about something that, it, like, I mean, I love to fly, but let's say if you don't like to fly, but you think about getting in a plane, you think about taking off, and you start even getting nervous, you're not even there. You may be sitting in the security of your, of your living room or your car or whatever, or maybe you're thinking about something terrified, and you, you get a nervousness, and your, even your emotions begin to, to change based on what you're thinking about. Isn't it interesting how certain smells can conjure up memories in your mind and, uh, of, of past things? And I was thinking about that the other day before I even was thinking about this devotion. And I was thinking, isn't it amazing how the mind can control so much of the way you feel? We know it's the, the, the center of your life as far as uh, the control center, the computer. But it's interesting that you can even make yourself nervous or make yourself anxious by thinking of something that was a nerve-wracking experience. Well, God is so interested in our thought life that in Philippians 4 he instructs us what we need to be thinking about. Why? Because he knows by dwelling on the things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things and the God of peace will be with you. Going back now very quickly to Isaiah 26 and 3, it says, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Remember, it is the word perfect is the same word for peace, shalom. So it is you'll keep him in shalom, shalom. You'll keep him in peace, peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. 
And now when you come to Philippians 4, you have the double portion peace, the perfection of peace. You have in verse 7, the peace of God, and in verse number 9, the God of peace. You get the peace of God in salvation, for it says the peace of God that passes our understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So have, having been born again and become a new creature, you now have the capacity to think the, things of, the, the thoughts of God. And as we think the thoughts of God, we dwell on the things of God, we, that peace, which is in essence is security, it is safety, it is, it is the, 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 the powerful arms of the Lord around us. And then when we begin to think on the things of God, then our peace takes a new heights. We enter a new level of peace and we find peace, peace. What the Bible calls in Isaiah 26 and 3, perfect peace. So I'm not just telling you something just to encourage you, yet it is encouraging, but I'm telling you something that you can do, something to practice right now to bolster the peace of God in your life. Where it says in Isaiah 26 and 3, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, 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 shalom, shalom, whose mind is stayed on thee. So there's a contingency for that perfect peace, and it is about where you rest your mind. So Philippians 4 says, if you think on things that are true, lovely, honest, virtue, praise, good report, all of those things. He said, if you think on these things, then he goes on to say, the God of peace will be with you. So what can I do, Pastor, to increase the peace of God in my life? Well, I told you when we get saved, we get the peace of God. We, 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 have, uh, we have peace. But God moves in in fullness the more we dwell on him. Do you remember the scripture, draw, draw nigh to him and he will draw nigh to thee? The more I think on the Lord, your thought life, your thought life, my thought life does develop who we become. Um, it, it, it's, I mean, it's proof if I won't get into all of the psychology and things of it, but even our physical minds, not even talking about the spiritual aspect, your physical mind, you can change your behavior, you can change your future by the way you dwell on things, what you think about. If you're always negative, your life is going to always be negative. You know people, you know people that, uh, you, you know, you just don't even want to talk to them. They, they're just negative about everything. It just, nothing is ever positive. There's never any future. It's just, and, and you come away just, I mean, there's times where, uh, you know, I, I can just hear somebody's voice at times, certain people, and it's just like, oh my goodness, I feel like crawling in a hole and pulling the covers over my head, Pull, close the shades, I want to be depressed. But then there are those people that though they have trials and they'll tell you they have issues and problems, they're not some masquerade, you know, uh, show in front of you. They're real, but they trust God and they have a, they know God's able. And there's a positivity there, a spiritual, not a, not a fleshly positive confession, but a confidence, a confidence in God. So he says here, if you really want perfect peace, if you really want peace, peace. Shalom, shalom. Keep your mind stayed on the Lord. How do I do that? Philippians 4. Think on these things. Okay, Pastor, what are those things? Well, anything that's not true, don't think on it. The devil likes to lie to you. People tell lies or we get uh, conspiracy theories get thrown around. If you find it out to not be true, don't think or dwell on that. It'll eat you alive. It will kill you. What things are honest, I'm not going to go through every one of them in detail, but you can kind of get the gist of it. Things that are just, things that are pure, it's too much impurity in our world. It's too easy. Don't think on that. Whatever things are lovely, things are of a good report, not a negative report. Amen. Not a negative report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, Think on these things. So no matter how bad the situation is, 
find something in there that has praise to it. How can, I, how can I praise God in this? That has some virtue to it. That has some honesty to it. That has a good report. Listen, not everything. I know the, 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 the stories are not always positive. We live in a negative world because it is riddled with sin. Yes. But I'm not bound to this world. This is not my home. I serve a God that is bigger and greater and wonderful. And, and I serve a God that loves me and that is preparing a place for me. And when this mess is over, I've got an eternity to look forward to with my glorious Savior. Think on these things. You know, if you, if you think on one of the most detrimental things, one of the most detrimental things to your peace and, and, and let's, let's just get real here. One of the most detrimental things to your peace is analyzing the what ifs. If you spend all your time analyzing the what ifs, oh my goodness, but what, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? You know, I, I had a relative of mine that's passed away now, not from anything that I'm about to tell you about, but... I had a relative years and years ago, and um, she had not been to a doctor. She had not been to see anybody, had not had any tests run, but she had a pain in her side. Just pain. It wasn't, it wasn't to the extent that she had to go to the ER or anything. just had a pain in her side. Well, she immediately thought and just believed she had cancer and went so far as to, I mean, she laid her clothes out on the bed to be buried in. She got her things in order, and... She was already making preparations that this is what I want to be buried in. This is this and that. She didn't have cancer, didn't have anything. Lived decades after that. Didn't have, never died of cancer. And, and that's kind of an extreme case maybe, but how many times do we sit there and dwell on the what ifs? And I, I've kind of comically made the statement even from the pulpit. I think it was Mark Twain that said he made the statement and it's one that, that, that has so much truth to it. He said, in my life, I have experienced many, many terrible things. He said, a few of them actually happened. And how true that is. That much of our suffering and agonizing is over things that never happened and were never going to happen. Yes, we're to be cautious. Yes, we're to be careful. Yes, we take care of our bodies. We put our seatbelt on. We lock our doors. We take precautions. But we're not to be absorbed in the what ifs. The what ifs will rob your peace every time. Instead of the what ifs here, what if I just latch on to the things I know are a fact? What is the fact that I know of God is? Hebrews 11, God is, and he's a rewarder of them that seek him. What is a fact? In Jesus, my sins are forgiven and I'm a new creature. Well, what's factual? What things are true and honest? What good reports do I know? Uh, I know John 14 said that he's going to prepare a place for me to not let my heart be troubled. And that if he was going, he would come again, receive me unto himself, that where he is, there I can be also. Let's start standing on facts and quit standing on what ifs. And the peace, peace, the peace, peace, the peace, peace will be yours. So I encourage you in Isaiah 26, 3, and of course, Psalm 119, 165, great peace have they that love thy law, nothing shall offend them or cause a stumbling block to them. And of course, Philippians 4. I encourage you to take these three passages, read them for yourself when you're not on this devotion, you're not with anybody, meditate upon them, Ask God to reveal the truths in there to you and walk in the peace, peace of God. He doesn't want you just to have a fragment of peace. He wants you to know him entirely. And the more you dwell on God, the more you get to enjoy his peace. Amen. You can have peace. It's, it, it may be a, a, a confusing world we're in and it may be a ridiculous, weird, crazy time. But Jesus is about to come and I know where my confidence is. As Job said, I know my Redeemer liveth. I know my Redeemer liveth. The New Testament writer said, I know in whom I have believed, and he is able, able to keep that which, is, which I've committed to him against that day. Know the peace giver, know the peace speaker, the Prince of Peace. Know him in a double portion abounding way. And I believe you will, you will 
make it. And you're going to make it with a smile on your face because God is faithful. Amen. God bless you. If these have been a blessing to you, any of these devotions, share them with somebody. And uh, we'll, Lord willing, uh, be back with you tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock and be teaching the Word of the Sanctuary at 7 o'clock on Wednesday and Thursday, Friday. We'll be back with our devotion at 6 o'clock as well. Uh, for all of you saying, there's some saying thank you. You are very welcome. It is my pleasure and honor. I love all of you. Uh, I'm glad we're finally getting to see each other in, in person uh, in the sanctuary. Also, uh, let me throw this in there for some of you that have children. Um, we are uh, hoping to have something set up by this Sunday for families with children that we're going to do separate uh, in the fellowship hall uh, for both of our services, our 8 a.m. and our 1030 service, and uh, that we'll stream the service on the screen back there and then have areas where the kids can have, act, uh, you know, coloring activities, uh, things, and, and where you could kind of be in, a, in an area with them, uh, not the kids all together, but you with your family and, uh, and then, you know, to where it, you can actually feel like you can come to church and don't worry about disrupting the service. Uh, I have told, told you and did the phone trees on these, everything. Uh, I want you to come. I want you to bring your children. Don't feel like you'll be a disruption. It, I can preach through them, over them, around them. Um, none of that matters to me. So, uh, be back in the house of the Lord. And like I said, we're working on getting a place set up for you if you have children and you would rather, uh, you know, not have the worry uh, of feeling like you were an intrusion or anything like that or disruption. So God bless you and uh, we love all of you. Praying for you. If we can be of any help to you, let us know. We'll talk to you soon.